Let's go ahead and open in our Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and let us see what the mighty Word of God has to tell us this morning. Let's say for a moment that this circle represents you. And in your day-to-day life, you have behaviors, or maybe you have a particular behavior, and maybe you put that in your minds right now. And let's say that behavior, though, is not, not sinful. I can't point to scriptures and say, well, listen now, that, that thing that you're doing, that behavior, this is where scripture teaches against that. Let's say this behavior that we're talking about falls into this category in your life. Well, let's say that you have a friend. And this friend struggles with a particular sinful behavior. And you go to him and you talk to him about that and you help him out, but what if, what if your behavior does something in relation to his sinful behavior? What if your behavior that does not in and of itself have any sin attached to it in your life actually leads your friend to begin living a sinful life or perhaps to fall back into it? Seems like an odd question, I know. But Paul actually handles this issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And at first glance, you might think that it really has no relevance to us because, spoiler alert, it involves meat sacrificed to idols. That's not anything that we really deal with today. My sausage and eggs come from the store. They were not sacrificed to any animal. So it's not anything that we might particularly worry about, but it actually has a great deal to do with us, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Because as we consider Scripture, we must take the lessons taught and apply it to our everyday lives. We all pray that regularly, don't we? So while at first glance this seems like a strange question, this this seems like an issue that we might not have to worry about, oh, contraire, it has a great deal to do with our Christian lives today, and I hope you'll go along with me this morning. Because Paul actually spends three chapters discussing this very issue, and the Corinthian congregation was struggling with it. It was causing issues, it was causing difficulty among them. Well, So what is about it that is so important that Paul devotes chapters 8, 9, and 10 to it? Well, it's a lesson that even the most educated of Christians should learn. And that is called the art of loving. The people of Corinth were very educated. So they had a lot of knowledge, began learning about Christ, and applied that to their knowledge. But what they struggled with, as you will see, is love for their fellow Christian. Is love for the souls of their fellow man. Specifically, how their behavior affected those within their community and their soul and their very salvation. Can we love those who we disagree with? Can we love others through difficult circumstances? Can we love those we disagree with? Can we love people enough when our own liberties, our own freedoms, might be at stake. Can we love them to that point? Does God's command to love others really dictate how I live my life? Let's see as we dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 8. First, we're going to look at the principle of the matter. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 Verses 1 through 3, Paul is discussing this very question. Should Christians eat meat sacrificed to idols? That's what we're looking at here in chapter 8. He says this, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, 
we know that we all have knowledge. But knowledge makes arrogant. So Paul here, oddly enough, is warning against knowledge. And he says we all have it. We all understand that the answer to this question is probably something he's addressed with them already, with the members, now he's writing to them. He's already handled marriage. He's handled many other issues uh, throughout the first, you know, several chapters in 1 Corinthians. If you'll look there in, in chapter 6, the body of Christ. Chapter 7, uh, the teaching on marriage, immorality rebuke. In chapter 6, he talks about lawsuits. Now he's addressing this question. Should Christians eat meat sacrificed to idols? We know what we know. We have knowledge, okay? But you know what knowledge does? Knowledge makes arrogant. Does it really? Some have said those who think they know it all irritate those who actually do. So we have knowledge, you see. We know a great deal of things, but what does it do? It does indeed make arrogant when someone thinks they know it all. And Paul, of course, wants to destroy this kind of prideful thinking. How many degrees do you have? How many, you know, how many times have you, have you read this? What is it do you know? You know? Those are important questions, and I'll get to that later. But Paul warns against knowledge. And what did we sing before I got up here? The greatest commands. What does Paul tell the Christians they should be doing? He tells them, what does love do? Love edifies. And we read of this in Matthew chapter 22 about the greatest command. A lawyer asks Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the law? A lawyer does. Someone who is quite knowledgeable. So he wants to ask the master teacher, Jesus, Lord, what is the greatest command? And what does Jesus say? He says in Matthew 22, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because love edifies. Because love builds people up. If you come in here crying, upset, if you talk to me, you talk to someone later, well, let me tell you all the books that I've read. That doesn't do anything for you. But when I can express love to you, in, a, in an appropriate way, what you need to hear at that moment, that's going to build you up. When I'm concerned about you, whenever I want to know more about you, about your day, about why you're hurting, perhaps how I can help that and use my knowledge in that sense, but what's got to come out first is love. Why? Because love edifies. Knowledge, you see, makes arrogant. He continues this thought in verse 2. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. If you think you know a lot, then you really do not know anything at all, is what verse 2 is saying. The truly spiritually knowledgeable know what they do not know. The more education you get, hopefully, that's the byproduct, is that you realize how much indeed you do not know. As we grow in Christ, we begin to realize that being a servant is more important than being recognized for our piety. At the end of His ministry, Jesus, His crowds grew to an extent. They grew and they grew and they grew. But what was Jesus doing at the end of His ministry? He was washing the feet of His disciples. He wasn't asking, where's, where's a larger crowd? Let me show how much I know. He was not doing that. He was stooping down to wash the feet of Peter who would deny Him, of the others who would run away while He was on the cross. That's what Jesus was doing. He was expressing His love for those that He had spent so much time with. Verse 3, But if anyone loves God, he is known by Him. The principle here is this, regardless of how much you know, you must love God and you must love others. Not that knowledge isn't important. Let me explain it to you this way. You know, I like camping. I like fishing. One of the things I like about it is buying all the gear. 
Not even that I'm going to use it. i got a stove. It's this tall that will boil water. It's pretty cool. But I like all the gear that I have. But when it comes down to it is all you need is a pole, a line, some horse hair, and a hook. That's all you need. And you can go to the Smoky Mountains and catch all the brook chow you want. You don't need all that gear. It's good. It's good to have. But whenever I show up in Sevierville back in the spring without my reel, I didn't, I didn't feel too confident. I didn't have something that was important, you see. I didn't have that important item. So it's good to have all of that. definitely is. I'm actually going to talk about this tonight, about why knowledge itself is important. But what we sometimes do is we start to show how much, how much we know rather than how much we love. That's what Paul is trying to address here. And he does that in verse 3. Let's read it again. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. It's not about knowledge. Why? Because knowledge makes arrogant. Let's continue on. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. Therefore, concerning... So he's going back to it, right? Concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world. And that there is... No God but one. That's the knowledge he's talking about. Okay? There is no God but one. For even if there are so even if even if there are so called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. There is only one God. Paul agrees with the Corinthian church. See, that's one of the reasons they were going into these temples and eating is because hey, that, the temple to that God, it doesn't mean anything to me. But they're going in. These Christians, these Christians at Corinth were going in and they were eating where people were sacrificing the meat to idols. Look at verse 7. However, not all men have this knowledge. But some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So you see, not everyone knows this. Not everyone knows there is but one God. Not everyone knows about Jesus and, and He is the only one and that we exist through Him. Not everyone knows that, Corinthian church. Not everyone knows that, Christian. In fact... There are some who grew up with idols and worshipped them for quite a long time, and so this would be a struggle for them. They realize now perhaps they have even converted to Christianity, and they realize there is but one God. However, coming out of a belief system is very difficult to do. When you've been raised a particular way and you change those beliefs because perhaps you look into Scripture more and deeper and you see that there is one God and and you start to follow those, those true teachings, and perhaps you learn that what you've been told all your entire life is a lie, and you start believing in the true God, it's difficult to leave that past. And these people who come out of that belief then and today cannot be around that stuff or it will hurt them. It will hurt their conscience. Let's read verse 7 again. However, not all men have this knowledge. But some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol. They go back to it. And their conscience being weak is defiled. We live in a time right now where when we think about being offended, we think it's about something that we do not like. And this is not exactly the definition that we find in Scripture. Being offended does not mean that it's out of your preference or you simply disagree with someone. Offense in the Scripture means that you are causing a person to sin. And this is what Paul is addressing. Not that you are just living your life in the way that you want to, but that you are living your life and you've got to think about what your example is doing. And this is the problem Paul is addressing. Knowledgeable Christians are leading new Christians or non-Christians to go back or stay in or to return to idolatry. That is the problem that Paul here is addressing. We know there's just one God. We know that idol doesn't mean anything. You and I know that. Not everybody does. But what is your example doing? Because it is not acceptable to cause someone 
to sin. To lead them in a direction that would take them away from God. So let's think further about this problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 8. <clears throat> but food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. The knowledge of idols not being real brings about now this stance. The Corinthians rightly believe, Paul says, that food doesn't matter to God anymore. He removed the restrictions, the Jewish restrictions over what a person can eat. And since there are no actual gods, who cares about what you eat? Food won't do anything in your relationship to God. Let's read verse 8 again. Food will not commend us. It will not bring you before God in judgment because we are neither the worse if we do not, nor the better if we do not eat. But what's he say, though, in verse 9? Let's look at that. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. You see, we're not talking about food. It's not about that. What it is, is it, is it your behavior, is what you're doing, is what you're watching, is what you're listening to, is what you are participating in? Is it causing someone to not want to come here? Is it causing someone to not want to believe in the Word of God? Well, if a Christian's involved in that, then I don't want to be any a part of it. Take care that this liberty that you have, and we live in the freest country in the world, take care that your liberties do not cause someone to sin. That's why this passage about meat sacrificed to idols is so applicable today. Take care of your liberty. This is one of the dangers of drinking alcohol. A person could drink, not be addicted, but a Christian could lead another person to becoming an alcoholic with their example. And this is where it is wrong. Scripture warns against alcohol. Scripture warns, says that drunkenness is a sin indeed. Still many don't have a problem with alcohol, but at this point, from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it's where one should really consider their behavior in light of that. Because while you might not have an addiction to it, there are so many that actually do. So now we can see what the Corinthians are saying. They know that an idol is nothing and there is only one God. They have that knowledge and they know that food does not bring us under judgment. So how is Paul going to continue to answer this? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 10 because basically he's going to now address this issue. Are we going to purposely destroy someone else's faith. We know that it's nothing, but you have this liberty that you can eat or, or do whatever it is that you want to do, but what are you going to do with that liberty? What are you going to do with that freedom? 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 10. For if someone sees you who have knowledge, dining is in, in an idol's temple, will not that person's conscience, as he is weak, if he is weak, be strengthened? to eat sacri things sacrificed to idols. So they're going to go and they're going to see that it's a good thing when they shouldn't because they don't have the same knowledge as you, Christian. The Corinthians were eating in idols' temples on a regular basis. And there is archaeological evidence that temples in Corinth indeed had dining rooms. They were the restaurants of the day. And the food that was served there had indeed been sacrificed to idols. And the Christians that ate there were basically participants in an actual sacrifice. Paul says in verse 10, by eating in, in the idol dining rooms, you are encouraging other Christians who do ha not have your knowledge or your spiritual strength. Remember, knowledge makes arrogant. Well, I can do this because I know it's nothing. I can have my liberty, I can have my freedom, I can do what I want. But what does love do? Love edifies. Love puts others before yourself. And so, in so doing, if you put your knowledge out there first, you are potentially ruining another person's faith. Your actions are causing others to think that worship to an idol is acceptable. And this is more than eating. This could be the start of a life that leads them away from God. To consider an Old Testament example, what did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do? They refused to bow to the golden image set up by King Nebuchadnezzar. 
Well, let's ask the question. Paul were to have brought this up to the Corinthian congregation. He could have made this point. Well, why didn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just bow down to the statue when the music played? Why didn't they just do that? Wouldn't it be easier? They could just think in their mind, well, this idol is nothing. This idol doesn't mean anything at all. They could say, this is just a large metal statue of metal, and it just means nothing. And, and they would be right. They would be right. The statue, it means nothing. It's to a God that does not exist. It's simply metal that will be destroyed and can be burned up. But what did they do instead? They refused to bow. They refused to bow because it was in line with their principles, with their Jewish principles at the time. And we should live our lives with Christian principles at all times. They didn't want to do this because what we believe in our heart and what we show by our practice cannot be separated. I cannot believe one thing and then do another. If the friends believed in their heart this was not an idol and bowed down, what would the rest of the people thought? They wouldn't have thought, oh, they know this idol is nothing. They didn't have that knowledge. Those people did not have that knowledge of this idol being nothing. The people thought, we better listen to Nebuchadnezzar. We must bow down before this, because that's what he says. See, because they're not honoring the true and living God, but who did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego serve? They served the true and living God, and they could not think one thing in their heart and do something else by their actions. That's how we try to ride the fence. But Jesus, God, our judge, sees through that behavior. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 11. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. The brother for whose sake Christ died. So you're ruining someone else's faith by your example, by your knowledge. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. You have this knowledge that you know this, this thing is not a God. But what are you doing? You are sinning against Christ. You're bringing down a weaker brother or sister. You're pushing away someone who might need to come to Christ and they are not. By your very example, you are sinning against Christ. So Paul says in verse 13, Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. So again, we've got to apply what's going on here to how we live and move today. If there is something that you're doing in your life that's causing someone to sin, that's causing them to live a life contrary to Christ, please reconsider that behavior. Not that, well, just somebody's upset about it. Okay, we've got to get a little deeper into it than that. Because Paul didn't say, oh, you know, there's some people that don't really like T-bone, so you've got to stop eating T-bone. You know, that's not what he's saying. He's saying something much deeper, something much more intense, something much more real. Your behavior is pushing people away from Christ. So be careful of that behavior. I have knowledge, we do, we have those things, but do you have love? Do you have love for your brother? Do you have love for your sister? And let's look again at verse 9. Take care that your liberties, your freedoms, does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. We must watch our behavior and consider how we live for other people, for this is the art of love. The heart that you see here is an original piece entitled, I Love You This Much, by Tanner Lawley. Tanner is a friend of mine. We went to Freed Hardeman together. And after graduation, he started living a life that was as far away from God as you could get. While behind bars, he had a lot of time to reflect. He started to lean more, once again, on the redeeming love of Jesus. 
And during the same time, he learned he had a talent for art. When he got out of jail, he began painting. And for several years, was one of the top selling artists in the world. Due to his upbringing and education, he was raised in the church all his life. Went to Freed Hardman, we were in the same classes together. Went to the same devotionals, had the same Christian teachers. that looked at us, tried to help us to live a, a good and pure life. He had that knowledge. It was given to him. But he will tell you that it was love that brought him out of that sinful life. So that's what he paints. He paints love. Paul said it this way, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now if you're not a musician, those instruments that sound that way are worthless. They're clanging, they're just not making the noise that they should. And he said it again in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 13. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, it's a good thing, they'll be done away with. If there are tongues, it's a good thing, but they will cease. And if there is knowledge, it'll be done away. So you need to learn a lot, you need to know a lot. I hope you'll come tonight and hear more about that. But if you don't have love, do you really have anything at all? If you need to become a Christian, if you need to get a taste of this love that Jesus has, I hope that you'll come forward. Or if you've strayed away from the love of Christ and you are a Christian and need prayers for forgiveness, I hope that you'll come forward and let us help you with that as well. Come now as we stand and sing.